Good. The title of our panel is, the grass is, is, is the grass really greener in India? And we all know from our own personal experiences and also what Dr. Roberts said actually about the Chinese students holds very good for Indian students who came here and didn't want to go back to India because they came here because there were no opportunities in India. But that clearly has changed over time. And now um, there's a rush to go back to India. In fact, there was a new a NYU had a job fair where they had Indian companies actually hiring Americans for uh, jobs in India. And um, Vinay, you were actually can be an example of one of the students who came to MIT and went back to India. And can you talk about, from a macro perspective, what has changed? What, you know, the grass, how has it become a lot more greener now? Okay, uh, well, I went back in 72 and it was uh, our brush with uh, communism and uh, still the license raj, where you actually got penalized for producing more than what you were licensed for. So you could actually be criminally prosecuted if you produced one more, more bike more than uh, what you were licensed for, you know. So those were the great old days. Uh, it's changed a lot, lot since, especially after 91 when India opened up. And uh, now you have much more money available, your foreign exchange, you actually could, you know, at that time, if you were given by Reserve Bank $100 for coming to Boston, and uh, you would, if you spend $2 on somebody's dinner, you could again be prosecuted, you know, and put to jail. So there were huge, huge kind of issues. Lots of challenges, but also great opportunities because of that. And that's how, you know, we, uh, some of us did reasonably well. But today for entrepreneurs like yourself, actually it's phenomenal place to invest in. I did some research study in uh, 2002, 2004, out of which uh, we produced our first book, Think India, Rethink India, and then Think India, which was published by Penguin. And I looked at all the strategic reasons why in India and uh, United States were coming together. And it's a well orchestrated strategy by both the government of United States and India. And it's to do uh, primarily and interestingly enough with United States government wanting India as a counterbalance to a gr threat of a growing, non-transparent, aggressive China. And that was one of the major reasons. It's not the economic markets in India that uh, United States is concerned about. It's their global security where India can play a big part. It's about innovation, entrepreneurships, and research capability that India has, and basically that India and United States together can actually become globally the most competitive nations together to take on the world. I want to focus now uh, the panel on actually the opportunities, the hot sectors, and within the sectors, if you can give us more detail about, you know, pick a couple of sectors that you have been involved in, but more detail so that the entrepreneurs in the audience can really sort of think about businesses they can build in these sectors, and also investors, I think, who want to invest either through private equity funds or hedge funds. So starting with Roy. Sure. Um, we like, well, obviously, I think, uh, the key with investing in India or, or uh, starting a business in India is not to get carried away by the, the macro trends and then blindly jump in because the mac macro trends are sometimes very misleading. So financial services is a sector we like. Um, now clearly it's, it's very hard to start a bank, a commercial bank in India. Very, very strong regulatory regime. You need a bunch of Reserve Bank of India permissions. Uh, massive opportunity, half the country is underbanked. I think more than half of, half of the Indian population actually don't have bank accounts. Uh, one eighth of Indians have insurance, so there's a massive opportunity. But I think the key is as an entrepreneur uh, to focus on the pain points. So, you know, one of the big pain points we are seeing is India is still very largely a cash economy. 90% uh, of transactions are done through cash as opposed to credit or debit cards or, uh, or uh, checks. So uh, we've seen entrepreneurs that have started to focus on trying to monetize that cash. So, you know, make, effectively build convenience into the system so people don't have to walk around with cash to pay their electricity bill or their phone bills, even though they don't have bank accounts. So they're using prepaid cards and what have you. And uh, we've seen a lot of successful, or at least a couple of very successful businesses around that. But again, the key is, they focused on what the pain points were and then providing uh, a set of, you know, uh, solutions that, that, that provided convenience to the ultimate customer. Uh, another sector that we like is obviously consumer and retail. Uh, again, 
very broadly, you know, growing middle class, everybody that does the math and says, you know, yeah, consumer and retail should be a massive, uh, should, should, be, should be booming rapidly in India, but the problem is retail is a hard business to do in India. Uh, rental rates are very high, so your, your, uh, your, uh, your, your revenue to, uh, to uh, rental costs or, or rental to revenue is, is generally very high compared to uh, the US or uh, Europe. Uh, what we've seen very smart companies do is actually try and build fulfillment, logistics, and, and those are again focusing on pain points, so it's not just actually getting the storefront up and running, whether it's internet or, or bricks and mortar, but then actually getting the, the back end right, the, the fulfillment, the logistics. I think that's the sort of stuff uh, that we like uh, as, as investors, and that's the sort of stuff that I would encourage you to focus on, the pain points for, for getting to, uh, to uh, making life easy for the Indian consumer. Gautam, what pain points would you focus on? Uh, so there, there are a couple of uh, areas, I think, sort of getting granular on the business side that we think are interesting, and then maybe one, one or two areas on the investing side. The power industry is an uh, interesting area. Uh, as all of you know, India is underpowered, and again, like, like with all macro trends, you can get uh, swept away by some of the, the macro data on, on, on uh, the power industry. But there is a, an active uh, a role for entrepreneurs to play in the uh, kind of clean tech and also in the sort of restructuring uh, of uh, power. So as an example, just to get granular, uh, a lot of the local utilities who lose money because of transmission uh, loss and uh, uh, theft are outsourcing uh, their um, uh, transmission and distribution and billing and collecting uh, to private companies like uh, Torrent uh, Power and others. So I think that's, you know, that's an area that uh, is, uh, uh, can be a bit capital intensive, but uh, nonetheless interesting. Uh, another is broadly in the real estate segment. Now, of course, you could do that by launching a fund and all of that, or you could simply do that by buying, you know, uh, two or three apartments or villas in Ahmedabad and renting them out uh, uh, to to uh, expats. So I think they're different area and and sort of holding for the the capital gain over the next decade. So I think that's another area. I think a third area, which probably has a risk of being rapidly overhyped, uh, as it already is here, is the whole social networking uh, and social media piece, but essentially porting, sort of doing concept arbitrage where you port ideas that seem to work here that you believe may work in the uh, India context. Um, uh, because obviously internet penetration is, is growing uh, rapidly, uh, though off a low base. On the investing side, I would I can simply say that um, so far most firms in India, mutual funds or foreign funds uh, like us, um, have largely approached the market one way, uh, which is a fundamental uh, analysis uh, approach to the Indian equity market, and that does make a lot of sense. But India, like any complex capital market, uh, there are multiple ways uh, in which to uh, invest and you could say, you know, peel back the onion. Uh, so. Uh, hedge funds or quantitative funds or other ways and real estate or private equity or hedge funds or distressed equity, distressed debt. Those are all different ways. So I'd encourage you, uh, if you want to sort of manage a fund, to think about something beyond simply long-only fundamental investing because I think there you compete with hundreds, if not thousands, of firms. Uh, uh, and I think that's, that, that is over the next you know, 10 to 15 years going to be a very, uh, uh, an area of very high growth. Thank you, Gautam. Vinay, I know you're very interested in education, and that's a big one that we keep hearing about. So if you could okay, talk. I think uh, Gautam and Roy have covered a lot of the areas, but outside those, so I won't touch on those. But yeah, health and education, you know, because with a growing population, um, uh, they need education and they need health, you know, and both the sectors were neglected for uh, quite a while. And although we have the IITs and IIMs, I think we still have only uh, gross, uh, you know, gross enrollment ratio at higher education of 12%. United States has 65%. So if we have to be a developed country, there's a huge, huge opportunity there. In K-12 education, uh, under the right to education, which was passed last year, uh, we have to add 250 million children more to schools. 
and that's more than the entire population of the United States. So huge, huge opportunity again. Of course, along with it, it's software, it's distance learning, all the sectors that you, you know, can talk about uh, apart from the brick and mortar, everything is available for there. Healthcare has to reach everybody. We didn't have a, a medical insurance uh, in place uh, till only t about seven, eight years back. Now we have a medical insurance and uh, government has given priority to uh, insurance for all its population. So again, an area which is fundamentally growing by leaps and bounds, right from the insurance to all the hospitals to the daycare, everything is growing. So these are two very major sectors. So I want to actually ask each of the panelists to come up with two examples of deals or situations uh, that they have personal experience with, with which, which actually bring out these challenges and sort of give a good look at you know, how, how these uh, situations manifest themselves. So not just at the macro level, but really at a detail level. So starting with Gautam. Um, two situations that, you know, we've been uh, investing and in, in trading in India for about seven years. Um, uh, and there are two situations that came up that were both w things that went wrong and, and things that, you know, really uh, surprised us. Um, and uh, where we were, uh, which things that we thought were unexpected. So the first is a regulatory uh, one and the second is a market structure one. Um, on the regulatory side, at the peak of the market in January 08, uh, we did a private equity financing of a, of a you know, large, uh, gr fast-growing uh, infrastructure company in the telecommunications space. And because we pay were paying essentially peak market valuations for this private company, what we call an illiquidity premium, uh, we negotiated in there a uh, put option, put meaning that we could put our stock back to the company in exchange for uh, our money back uh, if the company doesn't go public by a certain date. Um, uh, because essentially the company's justification for that valuation was that they would uh, be doing a near-term IPO. So obviously given the market, the global financial crisis, uh, which actually hit India uh, in terms of the stock market far harder than it hit uh, the United States, that company did not go public. Uh, but they effectively held us hostage on the put option because the rules between the Reserve Bank of India, which is the f uh, version of the Fed uh, in India, and Securities and Exchange Board of India, SEBI, which is India's version of the SEC, uh, didn't have, they had actually conflicting uh, interpretations and rules of, of how to, how to uh, something like a put option uh, would be handled. So effectively, the entrepreneur, uh, and you always have to be careful with entrepreneurs around the world, uh, maybe more so in India perhaps, but the uh, entrepreneur effectively used this to his advantage and, and forced us into negotiating a discount um, uh, to get us, uh, for us to kind of exit the deal. And that was uh, disappointing. I mean, beyond, uh, you know, someone's personal ethics, forget that. At the end of the day, he's gonna do what he's incented to do and the market structure or the regulatory structure incented him to do it this way. Um, the second example is not really a deal example, it's more of a market structure. Uh, an example, but it really led us to go from being a long-only fundamental shop to looking at other ways, as I was saying earlier, other ways to invest uh, in that market uh, where you don't take the, the deep losses of long-only investing. Uh, and ultimately what we have s realized that, that's ver been uh, very disappointing to us is a lack of depth uh, in that market, particularly when you get to small cap uh, and mid-cap stocks, which is historically when we started our firm in 2004, uh, the area we, we focused. And, and the second element of that in terms of beyond go, uh, being a shallow market, uh, which means prices will not reflect uh, fundamentals, uh, is that India has increasingly become a macro-driven uh, market, both domestic macro and, and foreign macro, uh, uh, global macro uh, factors that drive stock prices as opposed to corporate earnings, return on capital, scalability of a management team, et cetera, et cetera, which are really the kinds of things that private equity funds here in the U.S. would focus on or, or even fundamental investors here would focus on. So those two elements, India being macro-driven and, and India being actually a much shallower market at the lower end of the market cap range uh, than one would expect when you sort of hear about how fast the, market is, the stock market is growing were two significant disappointments to us from the investing side. Roy? I, I think uh, a good example is the microfinance space. Uh, last year it was the hardest thing. Uh, you know, companies that were going public were getting crazy multiples. And then 
uh, a couple of months ago, a bunch of bad things happened, and the government changed the rules and basically said, uh, we're going to cap uh, the interest rates that uh, that uh, the microfinance companies can charge their customers, which effectively killed the market, ki effectively killed the whole industry. So massive regulatory change, massive blue of the goalposts in the middle of the game, and you know a lot of investors were, were caught uh, pretty unawares. So again, sometimes it's hard to protect, protect against it because you can't see it coming, but again, it's the, mi the microfinance industry companies were massively overpriced in the first place, which is, which is something we all should have watched out for. Thank you. Binay, any examples? Yeah, well, I agree with uh, Gautam and Roy, you know, uh, there are lots of challenges. And um, take it for granted that if there is any challenge anywhere in the world, it's going to be in India, and you're <laughs> going to face it, <laughs> right? seriously, you know. It's phenomenal. And the regulatory issues are phenomenal again, and the change of policies are again phenomenal. Just in the SEZ, you know, it was touted as one of the biggest things in India, the special economic zones. They were given a 15-year tax break, you know, both for the developer of the property and for those who are going to be there. Just one fine morning on 1st of April this year, they withdrew it completely, you know, and with immediate effect. Huh? <laughs> and um, so those are challenges, you know, you'll have to face them. But still, if you look at it from another point of view, and that's again what Roy said, there is far more money chasing private equity and IPO money chasing Indian stocks and entrepreneurs than Indian entrepreneurs can absorb. That's also a fact. And therefore, which side is wrong? We still, if I want to raise money today in private equity or venture capital, there is enough money available, as long as it's a bankable project. O obviously, if it's a nonsensical idea, nobody's going to give money, including the Indian banks. But if you have a good idea, you will have actually far more PE funds and venture capitalists chasing you than not. In just our education, we could have raised money like crazy. We're still going for IPO. We refused all the PE money. But the fact is, I could have raised 100 million, 200 million without batting an eyelid. And therefore, you know, what astounds me is the fact that in spite of all the problems that are existing in the country, in spite of all the regulatory issues and all the negatives and including corruption, why is it that India continues to attract so much money? And that's a question you have to answer to yourself. And if you find an answer, you will find the answer to India's growth story. Thank but you, Vinay. Sorry, if I, could, if I could just uh, disagree with Vinay some. Uh, it's also it's true, al yeah. always more fun for a panel. Uh, I actually think you're starting to see what you'd call the you know, canary, canary in the coal mine of, of changes around uh, the, the flood of liquidity and, and uh, capital in the private equity markets. You're starting to see venture funds pull back, uh, funds uh, break up. Sequoia was in India. They've now split up, and the India team is effectively doing public market. Uh, investing instead of private equity investing. Uh, you're seeing global funds explore uh, d uh, deals in India and then not, uh, not uh, uh, execute. Uh, FDI has dropped off. Uh, FDI means um, foreign direct investment. Uh, so uh, FII is investment in the stock market. Uh, FDI is investment in, in infrastructure and real estate and, and sort of hard assets. Uh, you're seeing uh, FDI uh, falling uh, significantly. Uh, you have um, a slowing economy, you have interest rates that are ri uh, going up, inflation that remains uh, out of control, nine interest rate hikes uh, that uh, are starting to, to have an impact on the economy, political scandals that uh, limit uh, economic progress. So I think ultimately these are now having an effect on uh, private capital formation. Uh, and uh, I think India, in terms of its leadership, almost takes the India growth story for granted uh, and sort of uh, has this level of expectation that people will come there. But I can tell you now that we invest across Asia uh, in uh, one of our, in our, uh, in our Asia hedge fund, that a lot of other countries are catching up to India in a lot of fundamental ways from language to other things uh, in a way that uh, India is not a no brainer in anymore. Also, uh, you know, the great creativity of Indian entrepreneurs that they are flourishing in these extremely challenging environment. And I want to come back to some stories of where you've seen examples for the panelists of situations where um, the entrepreneurs have actually been very creative or ingenuous in situations 
which have been very hard and which you've actually been impressed by. So starting with Gautam. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, you know, one of the uh, key positives to India is that costs are low. Uh, yes, they're rising, the d differential from the U.S. is shrinking, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, costs are low. You can be an entrepreneur, a, a four-person four -person team, and start a business uh, at a relatively low cost, uh, you know, at a fraction of what it would take to, to develop that same uh, concept or idea, uh, whether for product or service, uh, uh, you know, for a fraction of the cost of what it would cost you to do it here in the U.S. So I think ultimately, and, you know, as we were saying earlier, there are so many opportunities. Um, uh, uh, we've backed an entrepreneur in the energy distribution uh, area who's gone from zero to 100 million in four or five years with relative with only eight ten million of paid in capital and he's built a team to sort of win these distribution circles from utilities and and uh, uh, improve the collection billing collecting and uh, reduce the theft rate so I think uh, and you know that would never work in the US because the US energy uh, distribution uh, industry is so efficient so in India the fact that so many things are so inefficient uh, is exactly where, you know, opportunities uh, sit. And at the end of the day, you know, while the things like, you know, th th there's a very common um, misconception that economic growth translates into market returns, when in fact there's no data to show any correlation between economic growth and market returns. When I say market, I mean stock market returns. There is correlation between economic growth and earnings, but not between economic growth and market returns. Um, but there is that correlation between economic growth and earnings. So I think as an entrepreneur, the fact that India is growing at six, seven, eight, nine percent a year and will likely sustainably stay in that range, um, that you've got the demographic, uh, hopefully demographic dividend, uh, and all of the things we, you know, we were saying uh, earlier really lend themselves to tremendous opportunities. But you've got to be patient. You've got to know the market. You've got to be there uh, on the ground, uh, and you know you have to know that it's going to be three steps forward, two steps back, and occasionally three steps forward, four steps back. Roy, any examples? Yeah, you have to be creative. I mean, uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's an example of uh, this guy who started a company uh, called BharatMatrimony.com, which is the, the Indian uh, version of Match.com, uh, though, uh, though it was more for actually getting married as opposed to dating. Uh, but uh, but he, he launched the company, uh, well, he was he was an engineer at Lucent in New Jersey. Uh, got laid off in the 2001 bust and then started a dating site in New Jersey. Worked well, moved to India, uh, started it there and then realized, wait, wait a minute, people are signing up, but they can't, they don't have credit cards, so how do I collect? So he actually built out a distribution and collection uh, uh, network. So he... He, he's an internet company today. He's probably the second, third largest. Uh, but he's got 2,000 people, of which 1,800 people are, are his, his distribution and collection guys. But he's got to do it because what happens is when you sign up uh, on, on um, the website uh, and you don't have a credit card, you can call in and say, you know, send your guy to pick up the money in the next 24 hours. And it works because the labor cost is so cheap and, you know, you can actually pull it off and, and still have very, very, uh, very reasonable margins. So again, being very creative. Vidal, any examples? Well, I think, um, you know, just even McDonald's, uh, if you take uh, McDonald's and that's how, you know, you have to really do some local thinking, which McDonald's did. Uh, if you go to a McDonald's in India, and uh, I don't know how many of you have been there, uh, the look and feel is exactly like a McDonald's in the United States. The food is anything but it, you know, <laughs> and it's, uh, paneer burgers and, uh, you know, pizzas with all kinds of stuff, chickpeas on top of it and everything. And basically, you have to adapt to local conditions. The pricing, the philosophy, and brilliantly done, a single move, you know, half the uh, people in India are vegetarians. And McDonald's, when they opened, they did one thing. The first announcement said, we care so much about the vegetarians that we have a separate kitchen for them. You know? And actually, every McDonald's has two kitchens, one for vegetarians and one for non -vegetarians. Even the Indian restaurants, vegetarian, uh, you know, restaurants didn't have that. Right? So that's innovation, that's local adaptability.